Uh, welcome to the second session for today. We have uh, a New Place, New Worlds program, which is a very dear program within the Kosovo Theatre Showcase that we love very much, uh, where we present short excerpts from plays uh, from various authors, and then uh, we have the stage readings, which are followed by short Q&As with the authors. Um, I am happy that we have all the, uh, we have Vera and we have Zuber and we have Zainab here with us tonight, today. Uh, but unfortunately we don't have Mia Vrabova who is not here due to health conditions. But anyway, we proceed, uh, the actors together with uh, Putrit Pasha who I invite here, um, have been working on the stage readings of this place. So Putrit will tell you more about the his concept for the stage readings and uh, the actors, what they have been doing over the past, uh, past days, and then we'll listen uh, to the plays and then to the discussions, small q and really small q and with the authors. And then with Ivanka Apostolova, who will speak on behalf of Mia Framova. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, such a pleasure to be here, such a pleasure to work with my colleagues and my friends uh, with a really good poor place that we have. Uh, the, in some days it was really fun to work somehow in pressure, but uh, it was really interesting job for, uh, for us. So we're happy today to have also the authors, also the audience. And uh, I would love to present the actors, Ermal Sadiku, Zona Berisha, Shpetim Selmoni, Janeta Gemoili, and Blin Suleimoni. All brave. <laughs> and, uh, sorry, I... Okay, so, uh, you will hear like uh, teasers, if I can call, uh, like a 10 minutes reading for each play. We try to reduce a lot of things, sorry, but we did this uh, for the sake of this event. And you will uh, listen to Volume Tech by Vera Morina, first play. Uh, the Man Who Was Missing by Zumberto Hernandez. The Astounding Adventures of uh, Absent Aisha by Zainab Kachar. And uh, Big Deal by Mia Framova. So have a good time and have fun. <laughs> Thanks. Volume Act 2, Scene 2. Summer 1995. Inside the space rocket. Giant windows provide us a view of the runway outside. With its back turned to us, there is an empty seat with some kind of steering wheel. Electronic device and stuffed storage compartments crowd the walls. Sule is standing inside the rocket. He's wearing a spacesuit, stitched on his hard arm, the Bosnian flag, holding a helmet in his hand. Fuck, 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 this is not good, this is not good. He paces around, notices the view, puts his hand on the windows. Astronaut Sule Ibrahimovic. Hello? <laughs> How do I get out of here? Please be seated and fasten your seatbelt. Come again? 30 seconds left until we take off. No, I don't want to. The engine starts humming. Smoke appears. Be seated. Put on your helmet. Fasten your seatbelt. Or you won't survive the takeoff. Fuck, fuck, fuck. No, this is not good at all. Sule sits down. He fastens his seatbelt. The rocket starts shaking. Smoke everywhere. Then the rocket lifts off. Rises up in a straight line. A device starts counting down from 10 to 0. 10, 9, 8. Astronaut Sule Ibrahimovic. Hello? 4. Hello? 3. Why? 2. Why am I here? I'm not the pilot. 10 seconds until first stage separation. Please take the lever. Sule does so. The first stage of the rocket is being separated from it. The rocket rises higher and higher. You detached the first stage. You have four in total. The stages are separated parts attached to the back of your pocket. They contain their own engines and propellant. 
They provide you the power to escape the Earth's gravitational pull. It shows us something. It does us some good. good. It does us some good at all. The device comes down from 10 to 0 again. 10. Astronaut Sule Ibrahimovic. Listen. I Six. cannot fly. I'm no pilot. Fine. Please get Six. ready to separate the second stage. One. You are yeah. about to leave the yeah. Earth's atmosphere. One. Take the lever zero. and pull. Oh, fuck, 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 fuck. The device starts counting again from zero, ten to zero again. Ten. Astronaut Nine. Sule Ibrahimovic. Fuck. Seven. Please get Six. ready to separate Seven. the third Six. stage. Seven. Sule pulls the lever towards him again. One last time, the rocket makes a huge noise. He reaches outer space, drops the third stage, then everything goes quiet. We see Earth shrinking further and further away in the distance. Okay, okay, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. Astronaut Sule Ibrahimovic. What is it now? You may unfasten your seatbelt. Where am I? You are currently at a distance of 1.4 million kilometers from Earth. Fine. And how do I get back? You are on a secret mission of the ESA, which stands for the European... European Space Agency, I know, I know. A secret mission to save the Earth. From Godzilla. Steer to your left. The fuck save the Earth. Sule steers to his left. For a while we see nothing at all. From what even? From this. That's uh... Then slowly the giant meteorite appears. V one Vioma Veliki meteorite, yeah, 75 kilometers long. And it may seem like it's approaching Earth only slowly, but it will strike in only two weeks. In only two weeks? Somewhere between the 11th and the 22nd of July 1995. And once it strikes, it will be all over in 18 hours. All humankind will be perished. Everyone? All humankind, yes. So meaning everything is up to you. Do you want to save them, Sule? Do you want to save the world? How would I? How? I won't guess. I'm just a ticket inspector on the train. How, how would I be able to save the world? That's a bit technical, but not too complicated. Your rocket's noise is loaded with e explosives. They explode automatically. And then what? My rocket is going to burst into pieces. And me? Is this a suicide mission? Am I going to die? What if I don't want to? Then it will take you three days to get back to the ground. Then the meteorite. Then the meteorite will strike and everyone and everything will be perished. Well, well, I'm sitting here facing the earth. I mean, I can literally see what's coming from it. This fucking meteorite. Do you know what I mean? Death. I'm just a ticket inspector. It's not my job to fly a space rocket. It's not my job to sacrifice my own safety to save the world from a meteorite. I believe everyone deserves enough time to make something beautiful out of their lives. Enough time on Earth alive to make something beautiful out of their lives. So yes, yes, I want to save the world. Sule flutters around his seat. But why me? Why did guy, you guys pick me? History is just a long line of dominoes. You were born in, Bo in Sarajevo. Your mother was born in Tosla, and your father was born in Mostar. You have dark hair, you have brown eyes, you are an ethnic Muslim. Take a look at the camera at the back of your rocket. You are not alone up here. Sule Dosso, he is surrounded by nearly 8,500 other rockets in space. I can see them beside me, in front of me, behind me, hundreds, maybe even thousands of space rockets. Colors in space are different than those on Earth. I'm able to see them just as they are, and it feels like we are connected. How many? 8373. That many? And uh, will, we, will we survive? 
I have a wife, a daughter, uh, I have a parents, <coughs> brothers and sisters, cousins, my village and my country, and that fucking meteorite is headed straight to them all. I will save them from some bad luck by taking up more than I deserve, and I mash it up, and even if it makes me sick, I swallow it all. I'll guide you through it, astronaut Sule Ibrahimovic. Just steer to your right. Sulia aims his rocket to the meteorite again. It's time to separate the final stage. Sulia takes the lever again. He takes a moment to say farewell to his life. Prepares to die soon. The <sighs> devices start counting down from 10 to 0 again. Okay, 10. Okay, nine, here we go now. Eight, here we seven, go. Astronaut Sule Ibrahimovic. Oh, okay. He pulls the lever. Slowly, everything goes darker and darker. 3, 2, okay. 1. Okay, so you're ready. I'm ready to save the world. I'm ready to conquer. So I start my attack. I have my rocket towards the meteorite. Air pressure pushes me closer to the other astronauts. Sh shoulder to shoulder we fly. They look like me and I look like them. Them, other man. Our rockets, the same brand, same model, same construction. You discover it when it surrounds you. Only then you discover your identity. In the nose cones of our rockets, we have the same explosives. We combine our strength with the same purpose. We are trying to save something. We don't know what the triumph will be. Can't foresee how much we are sacrificing. We never, we, we were never prepared for this battle. They look like me, and I look like them. The meteorite slides gets brighter and brighter until I lose my eyesight. Darkness, he shouts. I save the world for you. I won't let you down, and I promise you will see me again. I promise you, I will come back. Ena, Volinter. Lights go on, there is Sulia. He gets shot in his lungs. He collapses. Act three, scene three, summer 2022. Back in Ena's living room, Sulia gets up. Ena hops around the room kicking stuff on the floor in the air. You went to space? Oh, that's lit. Come to me. You can fly a spaceship. Anna jumps into her father's arms. He embraces her firmly. There's nothing to be afraid anymore, you know. Where is she? I have to tell her everything I just told you and just Show, show her that I'm back. <clears throat> Anna tries to find her inhaler. Mama is in Bosnia. In Bosnia? We are in Netherlands, Dad. I live in Amsterdam. Since when? Since they identified your body, they found your shoes, remains of your clothes, your bones. They found you only in 2010. Anna finds her inhaler, takes a puff. Happy and proud to have Vera with us here, the author of the book. So, welcome, Vera. Um, this was uh, an extract from the play, right? Yes. yes. Uh, do you mind telling us a little bit more about you uh, and about the play? Like, yes. A little bit more. One. Okay. Uh, so, I live in the Netherlands, I'm a playwright, I graduated in 2019, and this play was the first play I wrote after graduating. Uh, what you just heard, heard was the second act, in the first uh, act, act um, we meet Anna, she's pregnant, she's removing all of her childhood stuff uh, from her home, and then suddenly uh, a man uh, shows up and he turns out to be her father in the end of the first act and then we switch to the second act where he wants to tell her where he has been because we meet her in 2023 and she hasn't uh, seen her father since 1995. 
I remember we discussed about this play. It was staged, right? Yes. Yes. And uh, the reactions and comments of the audience. There was some interesting story because of this Bosnian connection of the of the play and. Maybe you can tell us more what kind of reaction there was. Yes, so um, uh, I wanted to write a play about um, the long history of violence and neglect, when, neglect, neglect and aggression the Netherlands has uh, towards Muslims. And I think that what happened in 1995 in Bosnia is a very big example of that. So we wanted to write and uh, make a play uh, about that, but also about a daughter uh, who's long for her father, uh, and nobody tells the real story to her. Just like her father just did, he even doesn't tell her the real story. Um, um, and we, uh, the stage got played uh, in 2021, and we uh, had uh, uh, very emotional reactions from the public, uh, and we were very happy with it. And you are originally from Kosovo, just so they know. So it's not by accident that we found a Dutch playwright to bring it to <laughs> so, yeah, the show. We could have done that, but uh, was there any comment or any question? Having in mind that you are not originally from Bosnia, so like this, you know, modern yes. uh, concept so of appropriation and this and that. Yeah, um, we worked uh, with uh, a Dutch Moroccan director, Abdel Daoudi. We worked with Goncha Karasu, a Turkish Dutch actress playing Anna, and we worked with Vanya Rukavina, a Bosnian actor. So we knew that in the beginning that this was our, this was our team, and we bundled our uh, own history and um, experiences with uh, the theme I just called the, the Dutch history of acting, this uh, behavior, uh, uh, and we picked um, this specific event because it's part of our, not only Bosnian history, but it's part of our Dutch history as well. So what else, uh, this is not the only play you wrote, no? You keep writing, it, are, are they staged in the Netherlands, uh, or out of the Netherlands, and uh, translated? Uh, so this is the first trans translation uh, uh, for one of my plays. Uh, I'm only graduated like four years. I'm happy to have uh, written uh, like eight plays, but uh, for so far that has only been staged in the Netherlands. And you think it could work also beyond the Netherlands, of course? Uh, yes, I think so, because it's also a story of trauma, and uh, sadly in many countries there's uh, many people with many traumas. And there are two, three characters, three? Yeah, two. Two characters, okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Do you have any question? Briefly, fast? If not, we move to the next reading. Thank you, Vera and Thank, you. thank you so much. <laughs> and it's good to be free to take comments. The man who was missing. Scene one, the stage is dark, then lightning, thunder, rain. From the back of the stage, the voice of Bashkin comes from an older recording. Great man never die, why they are immortal. It is we mortals who think we are doing something for them. No, they have done everything for us. I was lucky enough to know this man as relative, to fight by his side, but he had the good fortune to enter into eternity, and I, to remain thus mortal. Today, I have great pain, but also relief. Relief, for he would never find rest if his remains were not where they are today, near his family, near us. It's hard for me to bury my dear friend twice in a row, but a big difference. <laughs> then I buried him under a hail of bullets, and today, in freedom. The freedom we enjoy Thanks to blood he shed. May the ground of Kosovo be the light. Then bam, knocking on the door. Hana fearfully heads for the door, then a knock is heard again. She opens the door. Everyone stands in front of the stoic Agron until he finally steps into the stage. Agron? No one knows that you're back. They all know you for dead. You, you can't just go out like that. Clean yourself up and rest. I will pick up some stuff for you to wear, all right? 
I'll be back soon. You ready to go out? Uh, did you meet anyone today? The people I meet every day. You didn't tell them. I always struggle at this part. How was your first day? Good. We were making music. Come on, Mom. You're late. Because of Bashkim. Bashkim is alive. Bashkim alive. I'll be back in five minutes. Don't open the door until I come back. Do you know what I miss in this house? Loneliness. He has his guitar and makes music. I have to go to Anita. Where is mom? Drita goes to the door. After a while, Bashkim enters. Bashkim enters and looks around. Bashkim and him stare at each other for a long while. We thought you were dead, you rascal. I still can't believe that I'm back. How are you? You know, after you got wounded, maybe 20 minutes later, I, I came towards you and when suddenly my left leg gave in and at first I didn't notice it, but after two or three minutes, I, I saw my uniform become red. There I saw I am wounded. But who wants to hear this about you? They are not mean when you tell them we are soldiers. Things are different, Algon. Now I'm a school principal and no one asks me anything. The school is filled with people without diplomas. It's all about money, politics. And you wear a t-shirt there and they immediately, they brought you replacements. Three years of freedom, difficult, very difficult. I've told Agron. The important thing is that now the man of the house is here. Welcome. Scene five. Open the door. Luan heads towards the door. Hana is taken aback. I said open the door. Agron, please don't don't do this to me. Please don't, Agron. Not today, please. Were there a lot of people in the funeral? Which funeral? My funeral. How many? Do you want to see the funeral? It's the it's there, the tape. My funeral. It's a tape with a red band. There's nothing written on it. Agron searches and finally puts on a videotape, puts it in the VCR as the signal of the videotape begins. The same speech from the beginning of the play. Great men never die while they are immortal. It is we mortals who think we are doing something for them. No, they have done everything for us. I was lucky enough to know this man as a relative, to fight by his side. Why did he say that? What? that he buried me with this. God um, only knows. No, he said he buried me the next day. There, there were instances where even family members didn't recognize their own. They buried other soldiers. He was sure of it. We need to open up that grave. His family is waiting for him. Who? The person you have buried. Agron, these kinds of things happen a lot after the war. They've misplaced bones even, unburied them. After how long did this rebirth happen? We need to open up the grave. It's not just the grave. Your case. A lot of mistakes were made with, with the graced graves. A lot of families do not accept the graves as being their own. The voice from the videotape is heard muffled. But then, he stands in front of the TV, he stops the tapes, 
removes it from the VCR. But he had the good fortune to enter into eternity, and I to remain thus mortal. Today I have great pain, Paul, but also relief. Relief, for he would never find rest if his remains were not where, where they are today, near his family, near us. It's hard for me to bury my dear friend twice in a row, but a big difference. Then I buried him under a hail of bullets, and today, in freedom, the freedom we enjoy thanks to the blood he shed, may the ground of Kosovo be the light. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I would like to invite Zümer Kelmendi, the author of this play. Uh, his English is uh, poor, but I'll try to translate and act as a moderator. But uh, instead of him, because I know this play, and we just published it together with two other plays. Uh, so the story is uh, of a man who has gone missing from the war, and the family had already organized the, the funeral, and the family started to uh, benefit from, I don't know, scholarship, the daughter, because they have a missing, missing father. So the, there, was a, there is a pension to the, to the, to the mother for the missing husband. So they have kind of, they created the status that in, within the society that is uh, enabling them to live normally in those unnormal, uh, un, uh, abnormal uh, circumstances. Anyway, so this play starts when the man returns alive. <coughs> and of course they are happy to see him, that he is alive, that he was not gone uh, missing. Uh, actually, he's not dead because they organized the funeral and everything. But then, day by day, we start to understand that they are a little bit also not happy with the fact that he is alive because the daughter is going to lose the scholarship, uh, the university, the pension is going to kind of go away, and the, all those uh, benefits they have, they are finally going to disappear. So they try to keep him inside the house day by day, like wait until we get this, uh, uh, we profit this, this thing or that thing, and then uh, he, they also ask him to look at the, because they filmed the, the funeral, that in fact there was lots of stories of uh, organizing uh, false, well not false fun funerals, but like mis, uh, mis uh, using the bones of some other you know, missing person and mistakes like that. So anyway, he's uh, watching at the, at the funeral and like trying to understand actually what, what was going on in this period of 10 years that he was gone missing. And then in the end, I think he just decides to, to escape and <coughs> disappears from the, from the house. That's the, the story. Yeah. Yes, very good. Uh, uh, Zubair, uh, so the, I'll speak in Albanian, then you can answer it in Albanian, and I'll translate for you in English, okay? So the question is, when he's written this play, and uh, was it difficult for him to go out of this, so to say, general matrix that most of the playwrights and theater makers were having at that time, uh, of not looking at, at the, those topics in this kind of bizarre and comic, comic way? The I understand. Okay. <laughs> This play was first written as a, as a film script and it was also done as a film script. Um, when it was staged at the, at the theater, uh, there was a request uh, from the management for it to be rewritten re for theater. Uh, it, it was difficult for me at the beginning, uh, at first uh, sight, but then it was not that difficult considering that the, the environment, the setting is the same, just the way as it was in the film, it was the same in, in theater. Uh, 
For me, the, the question, the dilemma was always, you know, in, in film but also in theatre, uh, the in, in, in writing uh, by, by an extent, uh, the dilemma, the question was always what kind of a future are we building? Uh, because I believe that um, now, from this point of view, the reference to the past is done more um, to serve the present rather than to, uh, to actually know the past. The first thing I have to say is that the first thing I have to say um, yet on did a good description of the story, but uh, my goal was like that this character is, is like a rather passive character, but his goal was to break someone who um, changes, disrupts the normalcy of people's lives. Uh, Kachinins, it was staged in, in Pristina, and, uh, but it's not, is it the second or third play you, you actually wrote uh, after the war? You wrote some two more at least that we published. Uh, so how, is, how would you describe the situation of the uh, play writing in this country or the theater staging uh, young, you're not very young, no, but like young authors or Kosovan authors. <laughs> no, I'm young, but I'm speaking. I'm very proud of the authors and the artists of this book. And I have a lot of time for the fund. I have to say that for me, a period of presidents, but for me, a period of time when I was in the creation of identity in the theater of Kosovo. Um, drawing from the presence of so many people here, but also um, from what we have been able to see in the past years in theater, we can say that it's a hopeful period. And check uh, out these ideas. Yeah, uh, we are we're, we're creating and cultivating a certain kind of a new identity of the theater scene in the country. Uh, there is one bad thing for us as creators that we live in a country where there are way too many topics to deal with and uh, it's also difficult for us as humans that we live in such a country because we know that uh, you don't write plays, you don't do theater uh, for calmness but rather for what, uh, what bothers you, what disturbs you. Falinde, thank you. Grazie. Outstanding Adventures of Absent Aisha. Girls don't laugh aloud. You should know what's proper. Be compliant, be submissive. No one likes a rebel. You're an itsy bitsy girl, let your brain get used to it. You're an itsy bitsy girl, let your soul get used to it. You're an itsy bitsy girl, let your heart get used to it. Always be beautiful and ladylike if, if you, you want, want to keep your husband. Patience is the biggest virtue. What you call a woman is Adam's ring. You're a woman with shortcomings. Let your brain understand it. Never get mad nor sulk. Honey catches more flies than vinegar. Bear with it. Forgive, cover, and clean it. Motherhood is sacred and never forget it.
remember my words if you lose your way. Never ask anyone the truth. You think you know better than most? There is a whole life hidden in Proverbs. You're a woman with shortcomings. Let your heart understand it. I was born. I cried. I wanted to sing. <coughs> Mom and Dad weren't very happy because I was a girl. It would be nicer if I were a boy. Should they throw me away or give me up for adoption? As the middle child of a mediocre family, I knew that I would be a mediocre girl at the moment we stepped into our home. I received mediocre love. Then mom gave birth to a baby boy. All of a sudden, we had left mediocrity. A superb thing had entered our mediocre life when I was two. My brother had turned into a mediocre loser. Poor mom and dad had always believed that he was a superman. I, on the other hand, was listening to the fairy tales like Little Red Riding Hood and night, having nightmares at night. Did I tell you the story of the beauty who sleeps for a century? No, tell me, tell me. She slept for a hundred years. How long is a hundred years? Very, very long. How much is very, very? You know when we celebrate your birthday, we cut a cake, <coughs> right? Well, imagine there being a hundreds of them. A hundred cakes? Mm -hmm. When they found that house made of a of hundred cakes, the little match girl started immediately eating it because she was starred and shivering. And at that moment, a fairy appeared. What's a fairy? A fairy is a good girl. Oh, does that mean I'm a fairy too? No, I'm a fairy or not. Am I a bad girl? No, you're not a, you're, you're a good girl. Then I'm a fairy. We're almost done. The prince got off his white high horse. She'd been waiting for him since forever, of course, to come and kiss her. Well, he came and kissed the princess. Was the prince on a white horse a fairy too? Why? Well, I don't know. It's as though he'd had a magic wand. He kisses her. She wakes up in a flash with a single kiss. A girl who slept a hundred years. The end. Okay, come on now. Time for bed. If you behave all ladylike, you'll see the smirks in your dreams tonight. Hmm? Later at time, our neighbor from upstairs would sit me up on his lap and do bad things to me. It's all Little Red Riding Hood's fault. Forest is dangerous. Home is where little girls belong. That's why I'd never tell anyone anything. I was afraid of what Ertan would do, so I'd play games at home with my foolish sister and my superhuman brother. Being six years old was no easy task. I had to go to school. I'd ask my teacher, um, when are we going to sing a song? Not now. Welcome to Life Science 101. When you become a woman, you need to understand and know that life ain't yours. In the garden of oblivion, there's only one life, and don't forget that it ain't for you, but for the one who'll make your life miserable. In the garden of oblivion, the aim is to bury deep inside hopes and dreams to crush down all the passion and, excite them, and excitement of youth and womanhood, to kill freedom, to kill humanity, to kill love, to kill the future. And most of all, to put an end to being <coughs> yourself is the goal. To be a woman is to know how to fade away in order to exist for someone else, for someone you love the most. The life of each girl buried in the garden of oblivion remains out of life, out of everything. This is what science is. My dad had told me not to ask too many questions, but I asked teacher, when are we going to sing a song? Now is not the time. Welcome to physical education. The human body is divided into two parts. Girls separate through their legs and never rejoin again. Those of boys never separate. They, too, were born, born out of a woman. They have testicles. Oh, no, don't laugh. The truth is funny and requires seriousness. Bulls, too, have testicles, which are edible. 
those of men are adorable. Girls bleed down the middle, boys make them bleed. Now, arms high in the air, you see boys? These are called boobs. They give milk, they intoxicate, they hurt with rape. All girls feel ashamed, become a hunchback from day one and stand crooked all their lives, bring all the pieces together, fit them perfectly, but still is no good for nothing. It takes something, it, it, it's torn, it, it bleeds. Class dismissed. Grandma had told me not to be a rebel. I just couldn't help it anymore. One day I asked, teacher, teacher, can I sing a song? You must be out of your mind. No, no, no songs, no songs. Welcome to math. Addition, subtract, subtraction, multiplication, division. When you add a man and a woman, you get two. It Multi it called multiplication. One female becomes two. One comes out of two and again remains one. If what comes out is a boy, it's positive. If it's a girl, it's negative. Let's take a girl, for example. Say, she'll live till 70. Divide that by 10 and you get <coughs> seven. She starts school at seven. Add seven to seven, then you have 14. Some get married at 14 and start bleeding. Yes, 14. Add seven to that equals 21. She falls in love at 21, dreams, passion, tears, divided into fears, with anxiety for the future. There, you get 28. 28 plus seven. Now she's 35, youth, beauty, hopes and dreams all come to an end right there. Seven plus 35 makes 42. At 42, she starts to give up all her dreams, then it's even worse at 49. <coughs> Welcome menopause. Oh, womanhood, over. And what else is left? Three sevens. The husband eats one of them, the kids eat another, the rush of the other, now she is 56. Put a grandchild into her arms and the picture, perfect. Maybe in the meantime, the husband has kicked the bucket. She's back to being one. She becomes 63. <coughs> Subtract the joy of life, the beauty days, the happy moments, friendships. What remains? Zero. Now add that to a woman's life, zero again. This is how you add, subtract, multiply, and divide. I was just about, about to ask, teacher, can we sing a song? But then I remembered it was rude to insist. Welcome to history. What is history? History is up to the sultans, my sons. It's up to kings, rulers, lawmakers, rule makers, blood spillers, destroyers, ruiners, conquerors, and mass murders. But most of all, do you know whose history it is? Is that of prophecy of men, past, present, future, other than a few cheating palace whores. Can you, anyone name a single woman written in history? No woman has a place in history. A life not documented is not considered existing. Who cares about giving life? All that matters is taking life. Now, take a look at the girl next to you. History will not embrace her. Look at her. I've learned my lesson. Forget her. I have. I was a girl. <coughs> During year one, I got into a good university in a beautiful city, but in a different city. They didn't let me allow to, to live beyond these borders because I was a girl. Thus, I didn't go. I'd come to learn that what I wanted didn't really matter. What does being a singer mean? How beautiful was a young girl's hush? During year two, I got into a lousy department at a lousy university in the same city as home. 
all in order to hold down a profession that is proper for a girl to marry and begin a family, to be a good citizen, to work for 25 years and watch the outside world go by from my balcony for 10 years. Mom had also counseled me, of course, to find myself a suitable man in college. I'd ask what a suitable man was. Mom said, a suitable man is one who is suitable for society and the nation. He is handsome, tall, has good prospects, knows how to shut you up with a single roar. He is neither too nationalist nor too chauvinist or religious or progressive. He ought to be ambitious enough in order to give you a comfortable life. He should neither upset you nor hit you or make you cry. He should be a bit of a flirt with the ladies, but still devoted to his wife. He should be caring, father. And make you wet with a single look. Mom didn't say that. Oh, no, never, no. No touching, no sniffing. Let him look, but don't let him have. Let him kiss, but don't let him. There are girls to be married, and there are girls to play with. If you let him have your cherry blossom, then he'll just throw it away. Okay, mom, I said. But how, how would I know if that 20-year-old kid had a bright future or not? She told me to find one and bring him to her. She will know. I found one. I took him to my mom, and then she asked me if I wanted him. And how would I know? I replied. Have I ever known what I wanted? School ended, and I got married shortly after. I thought my punishment was over, but no. There's this thing called a wedding night. Ugh, the pain, the torment. I was disgusted by that fake Kino Reeves. Pain aside, I had just left adolescence. Child? What child? I'm still a child myself. I said no, no child. Let's first hang out, play around, take a breath of fresh air. My dad had tortured me all that time, home, school, school, home. I had no life. He gave in and said, all right, if you want, we'll wait a few years. Thanks to him, my belly has started to swell over a span of six months. I'd also already started working. I did everything in my power to hide my situation. I got dismissed from my private sector job. I returned home. Aisha was born five months, months later. I gave my daughter the same name too. It can't be, said my husband. When I began to cry and scream in the delivery room, they accepted. Aisha's daughter, Aisha. Upon getting stuck at home with Aisha, I got wrapped up in the television. There's this man called Brad Pitt. Oh, and there's also Keanu Reeves. He's a man who comes home at night, he's a man. I come to, to appreciate my dear husband. Mom stops once in a blue moon. She tells me that all men are ingrates and that just because he bore a child that he's going to re remain faithful to, my whole li to me my whole life. She said he should, should dress up, flirt, be coy and coquettish. And how would I know when she said, don't you dare pick up anything from TV? I woke up to reality. Indeed, love films always end with the man and wo woman uniting. You never know what happens beyond that. Everything that I'd learned about womanhood, I'd learned from those ads. How to be happy while washing the dishes, how to dance and swing while hanging in the laundry, how to roll up with complete makeup on, how beautiful <coughs> it smells. Time flies by fast. And the time then came for Aisha to start school. Great. I said, now I'm free. My husband then said, come on now, let's make a second child. This time a boy. <laughs> Okay, honey, I said, it's as easy as making a meat pie. Huh? Just tell me the list of ingredients and I'll make you a boy. Enough, I said, no more kids. I want a boy. Voila, we've made a boy. My mother-in-law moved with us, complaining that I don't know how to raise a boy. 
There, I said, you raise that little man and I'll work. That's it. I started a career. Mm, what a life. Then, one day, I was retired and I was old, naturally. I found out that getting old is repugnant. The doctors pulled and took me all over and I, and I returned back to the age 35. But that wasn't enough for my husband. What's the point when inside you're 55? Mm, he'd run off with some 30 year old. He said, we live in different worlds. I was just about, about to ask him whether or not he just realized this. And he said, now I love you like a sister, not like a woman. And closed the door behind him. I was left alone with my womanhood turned sisterhood. Uh-huh. So that's what mom said. That's the time off. Now I'll rest. I'll sit in the balcony and watch people go by. The kids have grown up anyway. And just as I stepped into the balcony, bring, bring. Uh goes the phone. Mom is sick. I brought Momsy home. I looked after her for another five years. I couldn't step into the balcony. I said, all right, she's who looked after me all her life. Made a man, I mean a woman, out of me. Now it was my turn. And I was done with my turn. Five years later. As soon as I returned from my, my, the graveyard, I made myself a pot of tea and took me and my tea glass into the balcony. I stared and stared and stared at my life. I scrummed around for a, for a song inside of me, that one I used to sing when I was little. I was going to sing it out loud on this balcony after everyone had left, but my song had long disappeared. I guess I never had a song. It was lost in silence, never sung. And at that moment, I knew Aisha would never have a song, had indeed never existed. Thank you, and uh, we invite uh, Zeynep Kocar here. Uh, she's with us. Uh, actually, we decided to read the whole play, right? <laughs> because it, we thought it's short and, yeah, and she's from Istanbul, so... <laughs> so there was no way to say no. So welcome, Zeynep. Uh, <laughs> tell us a bit more about you. I mean, you started your career as an actress and then... Uh, yeah, and I, well, I had an education of dramaturgy and we had a company and I said I can write a play because it's uh, easy to find a feminist play if I write. Uh, <laughs> then I started writing in this way in 2000 and then afterwards uh, I wrote I still write and play. Is uh, I think there are twenty now, something like that. I can't remember, but there are children play and short plays. I don't know uh, exact number, but I wrote this one in 2010, uh, and we played in our company. Uh, it, it was a. Um, uh, my uh, longest play, uh, which we play in our company, we played for five years, uh, and uh, it's about a. Uh, will I tell about the story a bit? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, it's about, about a girl, uh, since she was born till the end of her life, she wants to sing. She wants to realize herself, but uh, all the uh, children's stories, education system, the family, and everybody stops her uh, to be a singer or a sing a song. Uh, and she's a um, quite nice girl, uh, so she always obeys the rules. And at the end, she realized uh, she had lost her voice. Uh, and it's uh, actually written in a funny way and in a joyful, um, um, cheeky way. Uh, and it, in, in a rhythm, in Turkish, there's a rhythm. But in English, it sounds more feminist. <laughs> in Turkish, it doesn't sound that feminist. <laughs> but when I hear it, I say, oh, it's very uh, uh, hard words. But in Turkish, it's in, in funny uh, rhythm. So uh, it doesn't sound that strong, uh, I mean, or uh, progressive. <laughs> but in Turkish, it is 
a bit um, uh, because it's Turkish culture. Uh, it's a mediocre girl. There is uh, she is. Uh, a normal Turkish girl, she has education, she uh, marries, has children. Uh, she is not um, in any uh, despair or another way, she is just a symbol of a normal Turkish girl or woman. And uh, she becomes uh, at the end like her mother and uh, her daughter name is Ayşe also because this patriarchal system follows uh, itself by woman actually because uh, if any woman says no, uh, everything continues so mother uh, never says no and Ayşe never says no uh, to the system. So uh, her life ends without singing, actually. Uh, it's but in uh, not sad way. <laughs> but adding that the Turkish language has no gender, so this also complicates, I guess, the topic of your play. Uh, so, excuse me. The Turkish language has no genders like you, she, they, them. Ah, yes, that yes. Is, so that uh, makes yeah. it more complicated to for yeah. translation. Yeah, yeah, but in translation, it sounds more strong for that reason, I think, yeah. In uh, some Kosovo, playwright would start the play like this. I mean, not this mm -hmm. one, but some other play. They are Gender playing... issues. No, well, no, they are a little bit differently. They are staging a Turkish play, mm -hmm. and the scene, the next scene would be having Turkish embassy representative telling them not to cut any part from the scene mm -hmm. or the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, uh, is there artistic freedom there and are you free to explore any topic that you want or yeah, not yeah. only you but other authors? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in Turkish theatre is developing very well at the moment and we have uh, very high voices in Turkish theatre and we can discuss any topic in Turkey uh, because um, the um, politicians or um, the right wing, uh, or uh, I said, um, conservative wing, uh, never goes to theater, so <laughs> <laughs> they don't bother what we are doing. So, <laughs> and is your work staged there? Yes, yes. In national theater, uh, some of my plays uh, staged. Not this one because it's a bit strong for national theater. Uh, so why it's strong? Uh, because it uh, criticized uh, all the patriarchal uh, system and so, so they, they, they work in the spirit uh, of patriotic theater. Yeah, in national theater they love patriarchal system. So but also <laughs> patriotic. <maybe, no? laughs> so but, uh, mostly the uh, private companies play and municipality theater plays my uh, plays. Um, National theater also plays, but uh, not um, that strong ones, uh, more soft. soft. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, Zeynep. Thank you very but much. I guess the play is there, you can take it. And now we go to the North Macedonia. <laughs> and that's the last one. Mia Efremova, big deal. Act one, scene one, introduction. <coughs> she, he, is alone on the stage. One person plays two characters fighting in its body. That person is in pain. This is a pure play, written as a sad song, written as the last goodbye. We are already dead, running from the present. These lies never left my body, these cockroaches. They, they reach me, they come close. Did you get rid of her? Did you get rid of me? And I have all rights to love you in silence. And I have all rights to love you screaming in public. People sign for marriage. I sign for myself to never contact you again. I have the right to break my face. I am the right you have to face. You never stop looking me that way, like on our first date. I'm still staying, waiting for you to come and save me, to come and take me, rescue me. For this thing I'm becoming without you, I'm fading. Remember all I said? Remember all I showed? Remember all I promised, all aesthetic on your bed, all exhibitions I performed? 
That morning when you taught me, taught me how to get in your, in your apartment without a key. This is you and me. You lick your lips. We can blow up bridges, we blow up cities, we blow up ourselves. We are, we. Thousand years of me and you, thousand years of you and me, killing me, killing you, killing it. Where to, miss? Take me with you. It's human, it's normal. This means something. It was right to kill all our dreams. It was right to stay here. It was right to come back. It was right to fall in love. Look at me. Act one, scene two, the visit. The scene is arranged, arranged in a Rococo aesthetic Italian style. Huge room from an old house, similar to Castle. The human in already on the sea, looking and speaking to itself nervously in pain to the public toilet mirror. Cake on the table with no lighting, candles on the top in three floors, human's birthday. The dressed human is speaking to itself, bleeding from her nose, trying to wash her face, sniffing cocaine at the same time, then the scene is escalating into breaking the mirror. Open your eyes. Come on. Open up. That's right. Slapping itself in the face. I'm your tears. You have to see. Think about what I've done to you. To you, I'm a family member. You want this? You want me? Without me, you are nothing. No taxes to pay, no reason to drink coffee, no beer in the fridge, no weed in the jar, no music, no God. No God. No internet connection. Open your eyes. It's time for lunch. Your face will always be mine. The dressed human is speaking with its last breath and bubbles from its mouth. This time will be all right. This is our time. This deal is very important. You don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't crack into silver pieces. We can't get, get, go home, no, we, we don't dance. What am I supposed to do with, with this love? One more time, I know what happened. You, 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 you got scared. One more time, no more letters. Pull, pull the trigger, pull, pull me close. Let it bleed everywhere. I love red. This is, there is no end. Is this all we need to know, that there is no end? Yes? Yes. 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 Knock, knock. No. I'm totally unpleased. Can I come in? Are you mine? Cheap dreams, tunneled under our skin. That's how bad our life can get. 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 We must hurry up. Why are you not listening to me? Why are you blinking? Why are you breathing like that? Why are you standing there? Why are you wearing those jeans? Why are you driving like you're on cocaine again? You never left drugs, did you? You never left me, did you? Just pretending, fu fucking it, fucking it, fucking it. This process is called homesick. Stop blinking at me, stop waiting there. Are you high? Are you happy? Are you sad? Are you still there? Stand up. I didn't call that this time. I want you. Safe. I want you. Mom. I want you. Here. I want you. I want you. I want you. We must go. This part is called home. Act two, scene one, breakfast. The stage is in the same room with the birthday cake, only decorated as a breakfast room. The dressed human, now in red suit, is arguing, defending and explaining itself to the other human as they are a couple. I throw up the liquor. I throw up together with your best friend. Really? Again? Every fucking morning the same, you will never change. Nothing happened. This is insane. He washed my face and said to never ever fall for him. I didn't do it, no. But I did. 
I did. I did. I did. I know. Everyone, everyone does. He came for drugs and left earlier for another woman. What a mess. Jesus. That's what I told the police. That's what I told at work. That's what I told my parents. And that's what I told your ex. What do you want? To call the police? For fuck's sake, would you shut the fuck up? Ever? It happened. End of story. Mm. Is it my fault that I made it look like a crime? <laughs> really? I mean, really? Now you think I did it too? I think nothing. I'm done. Except... Except being still in love with you. The dressed human is at least ten characters all the same dressed as a clone of it. It wasn't me, she screamed at me. I screamed at home. My boss screams every day, so what? My parents too. Your friends at the bar were talking, you know, right? There's two fingerprints. There's two pillows. There's two cigarettes on the table. We are burned, I told you. I called the police. I'm sorry. I remember everything. Where's the human? Where's the human? I was asked about you. Where's the human? Where's the human? Where is the human? The truth. The truth, you say. Where is the human? Where the fuck is the human? Where is the human? Where is the human? The human is in love with you. In England, I guess. At the bank. Yes, the human is at the bank. That is true. And you sent it a letter. This is also true, right? The human lost you, not us. Yes, the human lost me, but you didn't. Where is the naked human? The human loves me. The human loves you. Which human? It's a different kind of love. Do you? I, I don't want it. Do you believe it? I would like to. Because you love the dressed woman? Stop the lights. Stop the play. You want me to touch you? This letter touches you more than I will ever be able to. Do you want to... Do you remember my hands, my words, my lies, my kisses, my stories? Touch me. Shut up. Kiss me. Shut up. I'm here. Kiss me. You are my friend. You love me. I love you. You love me. You can love me. The letter is on the table. Close your eyes. Close your fucking eyes. And it's hard, so hard to remember, harder to forget. Fuck the letter. We need to fuck. We need to make love. The letter. The letter is on the table. The dressed human is going toward the table at the end of the scene, picking a gun and hide it behind her. To all lost nights. The dressed human shuts the naked human in the face. In your face. I'm alive. Darkness. Act two, scene three, game night. The scene is the darkest place on earth. Both humans are holding ancient killing weapons. Don't waste our time. Don't abuse this love. What about us? What about me? You should have fight. You should have stayed. We know us, that's it. Are you happy? Can you walk now? Can you run? You should have run away. I'm not happy, I should have told you. You don't run from love. You don't run from to the police station. You don't, you should have run at this place, I'm here. I feel safe. I can protect you. I protect you. Prove it. I'm yours. Would you save me? Would you try at least? Darkness. Don't look at me like that. Let me help you. This isn't you. You're nice. I'm nice. It's not us. This is not who we are. Why? Why? Because I was right. You went straight to the police. Screaming. 
Go, tell the police. This is my best friend. This is me and you. We know all about them. Jesus. Look again. Look at me. I'm not going anywhere. And give me one line, please, of cocaine. I need your drug, uh, your daily dose. Is it good? To think of you like this? It's heaven. Love so hard, like Cruella de la Deville. Round three, the background voice on the screen is the one of the dressed human speaking as it was like before, everything. Like sharing a memory, documentary, or statement, poetry. My heart's still racing, you know. F1, final lap. I'm so fucking happy to see you. I collapse every time I see you. Oh, shit. I close my eyes, I stand. I close my eyes again, I stand. You kiss me. I don't know none of these kisses. Fuck. Fuck, who are you? Where am I? You, can, you, you came here with me. You came home stoned, drunk, on drugs. So high did we. Did I win? Who won? You. No, who won? Only one human can save you. I forgive you. We aren't meant to get old. Something strong that kills us. Someone like me, like you. This is where you end up? In my hands, in my bed. You want to stay. You don't want to go. You still see me. This is what I wanted to tell you. Listen, cry. I wanted you. Don't smile at me. This feeling. Imagine us a hundred miles away. It would still hurt. Darkness. Hide and seek. Their perception sucks. Sucks your soul, sucks your life, your courage, everything you have. These words are eyes, your eyes. You never wrote back. I wanted to escape. I know it's, it's not that. I would not leave without you. It's not a big deal. It is, I know it is, and you know it is. That was months ago. Can I have the picture? Can I save us? We will be happy. Maybe. <laughs> That's why you kept the letters. You wanted me back. We both screwed this. Yet, you are still loving. I'm not going to fight back. You win. You love you, you love me. As I said, you win. That's why you killed me. The naked human is barely visible. Kiss me. The naked human is becoming aware of its failing. Tragic love. I'm cold. Do you still love me? And the winter. Act three, you see? It's okay if you stop it here. Because anyway, the author is not here. And uh, I see you are passing pages like one. Yes, because one it's, 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 it was written like this. On, uh, ah, but no, anyway, uh, because Mia is not here, we have. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you guys, thank you very much. Uh, so we have uh, Ivanka, who is uh, here. and. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's pity that uh, Mia is not here, the author, but anyway, uh, Ivanka uh, works as some sort of, not official agent, but it is more than an agent promoting Macedonian place, and actually through Ivanka we got to uh, know Mia and several other Macedonian playwrights, including uh, two or three options that you recommended, but somehow we decided for Mia, and uh, so, um, can you tell us more about this initiative that you have actually to promote Macedonian uh, place? You created a large archive of place, digital place that you are sharing, distributing. It sounds like you are a kind of department within the Ministry of Culture in Macedon Northern Macedonia, to be more correct. Thank you, thank you very much, sure. uh, Yeton, and thank you very much in the name of Mita, Mia for this wonderful opportunity to speak because she's not present. It's a good chance for her. Well, nobody wants to stage contemporary Macedonian plays because we are corrupted, uh, country with corrupted theater. So uh, we decided to support young talents and they 
they just uh, come to us, uh, send us their plays. I read the, their plays together with my colleagues. And some of them are brilliant talents and we publish them. And thanks God they are active in English, not because I favorize uh, English, but it's easy uh, uh, in good English written by them to publish uh, the place and to make an international distribution thanks to internet. And people, if not at home, abroad to find out what kind of sensibilities we have who are uh, uh, very um, problematic to be staged. Uh, thanks to this uh, international distribution, actually, uh, Mia's plays were um, uh, published in um, fcol.com. Uh, uh, it's a uh, UK's uh, um, platform for audio drama. Uh, her play Albert was staged there. Uh, then uh, Big Deal was staged uh, in the, the producer's program by uh, ITI Center in Japan. And um, uh, we published all her uh, plays. So. Anybody who is interested, I can immediately send you the other, besides Big Deal, uh, plays by uh, Mia. And also we made um, video theater projects uh, with episodes, fragments uh, from contemporary playwrights. I can also send you the link. And uh, when we talk about Mia, uh, she's like how I experienced as her uh, uh, publisher. I experienced like uh, a huge talent and uh, she's like a magnetic vacuum. Whatever she sees, whatever she uh, reads, whatever she uh, uh, meets, uh, whatever she experiences, immediately she transforms in some kind of abstract the construction like a vacuum. When you read, it is like a very welcoming, uh, 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 how can I say, pet into her subconscious of experiences of bitter love, of coquetting with drugs, of uh, uh, endless self-destruction, of, end of endless destruction, and above all, she's poetic. That's why, thanks to her poetic, uh, po poetic dramatic approach, she has very open structures, you know? And uh, as a uh, vice versa, her very, how can I say, firm um, control to start and to finish long uh, plays, you know? And Did I get it right? So you gave up of trying to kind of encourage Macedonian theatres to stage Macedonian uh, plays and your aim is now to bring them internationally but I guess that would be a role then to bring them back home because once you get some international recognition they will for sure it's be tested. Like, it's, it's always like that because we don't have a brave courage people who are working uh, as managers, as artistic uh, producers who can uh, just uh, take a risk and stage those people, you know? Uh, because we also distribute to them, but nobody reads, nobody gives us a response. So it's, it becomes like more easily to promote them internationally because people are more open and they can even immediately give you some objective uh, feedback because they don't know what is happening in our country. They just read this, they like it or dislike it, and immediately you know on what you are, you know? So young people are receiving faster chances to be uh, somehow staged internationally. I think we have one question from the yes, director of National Theatre of Macedonia there. No, I'm joking, I'm making up. <laughs> when you say co corrupt, you know, corrupt structures, what do you mean by that? I mean, how that reflects in relation to place? Yes, but this is, of course, my perspective. Well, uh, political parties decided who will be general manager. Political parties have decided who will be artistic manager. Uh, political parties have decided who will be employed in our theatres, and we have only national theatres and hardly existing uh, uh, independent scene without owning their own space. So I hope so this is very clear, you know, no brave people, no extra talented people, no uh, people who would like to make uh, artistic risks, you know, just got stuck in their uh, clans and that's all. And if I might add is that in the, uh, the budget uh, for, for the National Theatre of Northern Macedonia this year is around the 80,000 years for the program, for the whole program of the season? You know, that's even not so important. Why? Because suddenly employed national theatres have huge salaries for Macedonian condition and they have a decrease in the uh, budget for uh, each production per year, which is bizarre. Tell me, is it logical? Mm. Suddenly uh, you have, I, I don't know, let's say 100 uh, euros per month, which is very good sum for the um, local standard to have a normal life. But at the same time, they just force you by cutting your productions, uh, pro uh, money for productions. They put you, uh, how can I say, um, in a position to stage only uh, minimalistic monodramas. I mean, what's the logic? What's the point? Right? Actually, when I get very desperate on the situation of the uh, 
Kosovo theater, I kind of open the window and I look through Macedonia and Albania and then I kind of get very Montenegro too, so I get very relaxed. Thank you so much, Ivanka, Kostova. Uh, thank you. Uh, we, have, uh, we have some very important notice for you. We are going to make a short break of uh, 30 minutes. And for, come back at 4 p.m. for a very interesting but informal <coughs> session of international theater market, uh, market where several uh, guests, hosts, and different uh, people will present briefly up to five, six, seven minutes projects they are working on. They are going to pitch their international collaboration projects and whatever. So we have some 10 interesting people who are going to be with us, so Please. bear with us. Thank you, thank you.